Well, last week we continued our series on the Lord's Prayer, and uh, our our topic was "Give us this day our daily bread." And uh, I am I am just overwhelmed. This is a uh, this is a great uh, offering of it's not bread, but it's rice and beans, and uh, it's it's going to the, the food bank at La Sagrada Familia, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But thank you. So so much. This is give us this day our daily bread. And today we're going to move into um, the, the next phrase of the Lord's Prayer that is is powerful. And it's uh, one that is it's just, I think, stocked full of, full of a lot of emotion. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Some of us say, forgive us our debts, as we forgive those, or some of us say, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. They all describe the same thing. They all describe the same thing. The first thing we want to do, though, this morning is, is get a handle on what Jesus is talking about because there's something we're forgiving and there's something we're being forgiven of and we got to kind of understand that in order to understand both ends of the equation here. And um, for me, anyway, um, one of the easiest ways to think of this is in financial terms. Um, to think of those, of, to think of debtors and to think of those who have extend debt to others. So let me ask you, um, I think it's a pretty basic question this morning. So when you incur a debt, who has to pay? Okay, you had me worried for a second. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's pretty easy. You owe, you pay. Oh, he pays. Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's the world, world economy, isn't it? Um, so second question, how many of you, when you've taken out a loan before or for a car or charged something on a credit card or ever had, uh, how many of you have ever had a lineup of people coming up and say, oh, I'll pay for you. I'll pay for you. Ha doesn't happen often, does it? Doesn't happen very often. Yeah, there are businesses that make their living on this. Credit card companies and, and banks and department stores and, and mortgage companies. And as laid back and, as, and, and encouraging as they are to get you into debt, they are rather passionate about that you owe, you pay thing, aren't they? <laughs> They, that, that's, you can, you could, you, in fact, you could even test their passion about that. <laughs> One day going into your banker and just saying something like, you know, I, I just can't live with these loan payments any longer. I find them very oppressive. They restrict my lifestyle. They are no fun. And uh, your banker might get a little concerned about you, don't you think? If you were to say that, they might, they, they even have special animal names for people who work on the streets loaning money. But they aren't the cute animals that are out there. They aren't lone puppies or lone kitties or lone bunnies. No, they are, a, they are named after a much more aggressive creature. We call them lone sharks. sharks. You know them. <laughs> Yeah, debt repayment is a very serious business, isn't it? And so when Jesus says in this prayer that he has taught us and as we've described over and over again how it's more than just a prayer. It really is a way for us to, to have a lot of questions answered in life. It helps us with the challenges, a lot of challenges in life. Jesus says, forgive us our debts or forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors or those who sin against us. We really need to find out what that means. And again, we've said, uh, there's two parts to this. On, on one side is an acknowledgement that I'm a sinner. But I'm a sinner. I have sinned. I have sinned many times. I have a mountain of disobedience or a mountain of debt that I cannot pay. All of us have debt like that that someone has to pay. And of course we understand that we need to be, have that debt paid or we need to have someone who cleanses our sin. On the other side, I've been sinned against. 
Other people have a debt to me. Maybe someone very close to you has twisted the truth about you or someone in your business has cheated and received the credit that you deserve for something you did. Um, maybe somebody hurt you. They didn't even mean to hurt you, but nevertheless they did. Uh, your mom or your dad, maybe they belittled you or neglected you or abused you. There are difficult people to be around who have sinned against you. They are in your workplace, they are in your neighborhood, they are in your family, and they are even in your church. Don't look to the side right now because uh, one of them might be sitting next to you this morning. One of them might be sitting next to you. So what do you do with people who've sinned against you? What do you do with people who are your debtors, as we say? Will you extend forgiveness? Will you release it? Will you give grace to those who have sinned against you? When we don't extend forgiveness, the unforgiveness is like a destructive cancer in our life. It'll eat you up. It will. It'll wound families. It'll wound churches. It, it, it separates offices. It, 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 it's hard on marriages. You name it. it it's, it's a cancer that, that, that seeps in. I've seen it. And I bet you, you have too. So Jesus is very clear what he thinks about forgiveness and unforgiveness. And it all centers about one little word. And the word is as. Notice he says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, if we look at this, that word as could actually be a terrifying word, couldn't it? It could be a terrifying word because it states that Jesus will treat us as we treat others. So one day Peter was having trouble with this whole forgiveness thing and understanding it. And so he came to Jesus and his question was, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Should it be seven times? And Jesus replied, no, 70 times seven. And so to illustrate it, Jesus told a story, as he often did, of one of his parables. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his counts, accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought into him who owed him millions of dollars. Actually, in the original language, the phrase is he owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now, I looked it up, and a talent is roughly equal do, do, do your math this morning. A talent is roughly equal to what one person can earn in 20 years. So add a zero and double it. If we do the math, that's what one person could earn over 200,000 years. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Quite obviously, Jesus was picking a number so big that it would be off the charts. It's sort of like us saying gazillions and gazillions. It's, it's, it's one of those words that Jesus was just pulling it out of the air. Or, or maybe something else we can all sort of relate to. We could consider something like our current national debt of $20 trillion, but we digress if we go there. We don't want to go there. The parable pushes us, though, to ask some questions doesn't it? It pushes us to ask some questions. How could this guy ever amass such a debt? I mean, even with a Visa card, that would be hard. I mean, how did he do it? How did he do it and, and, and not think, do I have a method to repay this? Didn't he know he would eventually have to pay it? That there would be a day of reckoning? Well, we don't know the answer to that one. Jesus is simply stating that this debt was something no person, especially an unemployed slave, which he was, could ever repay. But yet the principle was, you owe and you pay. Verses 25 and 26 in the story, the listeners are now cringing for the, for, the, for the tragic consequences and the king orders that his family and he be sold to pay the debt. Now, 
not paying a debt was huge. People and families would be thrown into prison perhaps for the rest of their lives and their kids' lives. It was called debtor's prison. It was a horrible thing. And so, the man falls to his knees and begs for time. I will repay you, please, please, just put me on the installment plan. Put me on the installment plan. And much to the surprise of the crowd, and I'll bet you much to the surprise of the man, we read in verse 27, he says, Then the master was filled with pity for him, and he released him, and he forgave his debt. Now, what does this say about the man in debt? Well, one of the things it says to me is this guy was incredibly persuasive. Oh my goodness. To convince the king to have mercy on him. Is the man, though, just bad with numbers? Because any plan to pay that debt would be a little bit like trying to empty Lake Powell with a straw. I mean, it, 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 it's really an insult, an insult to the king's intelligence to even put forth an installment plan for something like that. And what does it say about the king? Does it say that the king was just plain foolish or was he just a bad bookkeeper? Didn't he know how many zeros were behind that debt number? And the answer to that one is no. I think he knew exactly the enormity of the debt down to the very penny. And remember, the debt doesn't go away. The debt doesn't go away. And someone has to pay it or someone has to absorb the loss. Either way. And in this case, the king says, I'll pay. I'll take the hit. So he pays the unpayable debt. And friends, that's what we call grace, isn't it? Paying, paying the unpayable debt. This is a new economy. This is God's economy. It goes like this. I or we owe and God pays. God pays and we go free. How grateful must this guy have been? Think about it. How grateful must this guy have been? Right? Well, before we go on, I think we need to pause and make this even just a little bit more personal for each of us to think about. You see, there is a king. It is God. Who is full of grace, for sure. But he's also very just. And you and I have accumulated a huge amount of debt. Not in dollars, but, but a moral debt. We sin, and according to the, the laws, the, the economics of it, we need to pay. We owe. It isn't really too hard to understand this. Yet, when we're really honest about ourselves, we, we realize that, that we every time we are less than honest, every time we treat somebody impatiently, every time we misrepresent ourselves on our income taxes or an expense account or something like that, every time we, we say unkind words or even just, just think those things about another person, every time we grab for power rather than leading by serving, every racist joke, every impure thought, every gossip, every, every, every time I make life all about me, every time I'm not grateful and grumble instead, those are the places where that mountain of moral debt becomes real in our eyes. One of the healthiest activities I can ever recommend, and actually uh, I've, I've done it before, and, and we do it from time to time in a very small way, but it's to take a notepad and begin to write down places where you know that you've fallen short as we say our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Everything that you think of where you've gone wrong, don't be worried about exposing new stuff to God. He knows. Just because you write it down isn't going to make it any clearer to him. He already knows. I think it's so healthy to do that. Of course, you don't need to let anybody else see it. But it's healthy because we need to know that Jesus has paid a price, not for an anthill of sin, but for a mountain of it. 
a mountain of my own. It didn't take me long to accumulate this list. It was real easy. I just thought about Betsy. <laughs> who has watched me do all of them. <laughs> who has watched me do them all. I've done them all. I've got a mountain of moral debt. I've got it. But Jesus came to me with my mountain of moral debt and he said, you owe, you owe. And he said, I'll pay. You owe, I'll pay. And he's come to you with the same deal. He's come to you with the very same deal. And when, when I think of the cost, that it costs the king of life his son, I'm just overwhelmed. Grace is great stuff, isn't it? It's a, that's why the song is called Amazing Grace. Grace is absolutely amazing. Let's go on to part two of the parable. The parable's not over. We go back to verse 28. Jesus said, but when the man left the king, we would think a very grateful man, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. Be patient and I'll pray, he pleaded. But his creditor would not, wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and jailed until the debt could be paid in full. Again, this man went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him some money. And the, the, in the original language, the, the amount of money was 100 denarii. And again, Jesus is very clear that that's lunch money in comparison to what he owed. And the servant who owed that 100 denarii asked for time and mercy. And he says, I will pay you back. That's a very payable debt, and I'll pay you back. Sound familiar? Surely he's going to show grace because of what the king had done for him. For this man to receive grace for his mountain of debt, surely he will grant it for this anthill of debt to the other man. I mean, this is a no-brainer, isn't it? I've received so much from the king, so this, tiny, this is a tiny way of saying thanks. I will forgive this person, or at least I will give him some time. But no, he grabs him by the throat and he demands payment. He chooses anger, and he chooses bitterness, and he chooses resentment. No forgiveness, no mercy, no time, or chance to pay. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, notice a couple things about our main character here. In part one, he doesn't ask for grace. He wants the work it out plan, as impossible as the debt was. And when he's offered grace, he took it. And there was no thanksgiving, no changed attitudes. He just, just this, I'm entitled or I'm, I'm so off the hook attitude. And he ran away. Contrast this to another story in the New Testament. This wasn't a parable. This was a real life guy. His name was Zacchaeus. Maybe you remember the story. He was a crooked tax collector in the New Testament. And, and when he found Jesus, when Jesus and he had lunch together one day, Jesus offers him forgiveness. And he accepts Jesus' forgiveness. And there was this overwhelming desire inside of Zacchaeus to say thanks. He knew he could never adequately express it. But from the gratitude of his heart, he said, I'm going to repay all the people that I've cheated over the years. I'm going to repay them not one to one, but four to one. I'm going to repay him four to one what he had cheated them. You see, Jesus, Zacchaeus knew that he was forgiven. And this man just wanted to get off the hook. And there's a huge difference, isn't there? True forgiveness received gratefully touches us at the core of who we are. I ran across this quote by a man by the name of John Stott. He's a theologian from, from England. And he said this, he says, Once our eyes have been opened to see the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries which others have done to us appear, by comparison, extremely trifling. If, on the other hand, we have an exaggerated view of the offenses of others, it proves that we have minimized our own. I 
I think I'm a lot like this guy. I do. I've been forgiven a mountain of debt by Jesus, my King, and there are times yet where I will delay or I will engage in passive-aggressive behavior or withhold forgiveness and grace even sometimes to those that I love the most. It's that same amazing lack of gratitude. I may not go up and grab people by the throat, but I've certainly said things and thought things, some to even inflict pain and even at times to get revenge. I know myself pretty well. My character has some rough edges that need some work on it. In fact, I'm the biggest sinner I know. I'm the biggest sinner I know. Yet I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. And friends, you are the biggest sinner you know too. You are the biggest sinner you know. If you and I have received God's forgiveness, it is unthinkable not to forgive others, isn't it? It just is. The other people were looking on, verse 31, the story goes on, Jesus' story. He says, the other people looking on were very upset when they saw the grace withheld by the creditor, and so should we. What are the consequences? Well, here's what the king said. He said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had mercy on you? And then he sent him to prison. And then Jesus said in this sobering statement, he said, and that's what will happen to us if we refuse each other to forgive each other from, our, from, from the heart. We not get thrown into prison, but we get thrown into a prison in our own life, in our own heart. We become in bondage to sin. It's simply preposterous, isn't it, when we read this parable to withhold forgiveness, and yet we do it. Although we're still recipients of God's grace, we, we cut ourselves up from, from all that he wants us to do in our lives by refusing to forgive. Unforgiveness short-circuits our ability to love others. Unforgiveness takes away the joy that we experience in life. Unforgiveness takes away the peace that can rule our lives that God wants for each and every single one of us. And it bogs our prayer life down because it just gets closed in in this, in this, in this slavery. Now let's be clear this morning what forgiveness is and what it's not. It does not mean we, that we excuse or that we tolerate r repeated wrongdoing. It's not putting up with wound-inflicting behavior. It's not just saying, I'm a whipping boy or a whipping girl. If you forgive, but the other person refuses to come to you, you may not ever be able to be fully reconciled. But the Apostle Paul says, forgive and be at peace with others as much as it depends on you. Here's what forgiving means. Forgiving means giving, excuse me, forgiving them means giving up the right to hurt them back and to begin to wish them well before God. Let me read that one more time. Forgiving them means giving up the right to hurt them back and to begin to wish them well before God. Forgiveness is a God thing. And sometimes it takes a while. But God has promised to give us help. I ran across this story many years ago about people after the Second World War. It's from an author whose name is Walter Wink. And he writes about Polish Christians who received a visit from two peacemakers a number of years after the end of World War II. And they asked the Polish Christians if they would be willing to meet with some Christians from West Germany. Germany and Poland. They want to ask for forgiveness for what Germany did to you during the war and begin a new relationship. And, they, and after they asked, there was a long silence. One of them responded, it is impossible. 
Every stone in Warsaw is covered with our blood that they spilled. No forgiveness. No forgiveness. The peacemakers from Germany understood the, their emotion. As they finished their visit, as they were leaving, they decided to close in the Lord's Prayer. And they knelt down and prayed as Christians have in every country for 2,000 years. And they begin like this. Our Father who art in heaven. And then forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And suddenly there was dead silence. Dead silence in the room. They couldn't go on. And it lasted a long time. It was one of those uncomfortable silence. They were greatly distressed. And finally, one of those who said there will be no forgiveness said, I have to forgive. If I don't forgive, I can no longer say this prayer. I can no longer call myself a Christian if I do not forgive. Humanly speaking, I can't do it. But God's going to give me the strength. Wink finishes the story and he writes that 18 months later, there was a regular ongoing fellowship established between, in Vienna between the German Christians and Polish Christians beginning a new reconciled relationship. You know, I just thought about that story. And I just wonder how many marriage, marriages could be saved? How many friendships healed? How many churches saved from destructive splits and other relationships healed if when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we just stopped at that line every time and let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts? So I thought, well, why not this morning? Let's do some of that hard work together. It's time to let God give us the strength to forgive. It's time to remember the mountain of death that God forgave you and me. To think of what it cost God. To ask God to bring to mind any of your debtors. Any of those who have trespassed against you. And reveal where there's any hardness of heart or bitterness toward anyone in your life. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I want us to stop right now and join me. I want you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to stop together at that, at that moment. And then I'm going to close in a prayer after that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I'm guessing that there are some here today who are sensing a, a prompting to, to come clean and admit our debt of sin to you and to receive as a free gift your grace, that amazing grace that only you can give, that you paid the price, Jesus, that no one could pay, especially us. And we ask this morning, Lord, that you would cleanse us. Cleanse us from, know that, that because we have, we've trusted in Jesus, in your death and resurrection, that that's clean, that, that's done now. And as best we know how, we admit our, our need for your forgiveness and desire to trust you for it. 
we want to trust you for our life now and for our futures too. Thank you for that promise that we can trust. And I'm also guessing, Lord, today that there are some of us here who have been, who have some, who have some forgiving that we need to do. We've been hurt and we've not been able to release our desire to, to hurt them back and wish them well. In this moment, not by our strength, God, because this is only you. Only, only, only you can do this. We forgive those who have sinned against us. We forgive them right now. Thank you for the freedom, Lord, that you give us. Thanks for lifting the load of unforgiveness and bitterness in our life. Help us, help us to live now as, as grateful, grace-filled people willing to extend grace to others. And we pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen.